So let's get started. So stars of Scorpius from nursery to crematorium. So the origins of this was actually for me in COVID. Um, my wife went ahead and shared with me in May of 2020, the May April or the May issue of 2029's astronomy. Uh, but I didn't have to share it with her. She had already absorbed and digested everything that was part of it. So Phil Harrington, those who knock through libraries or even their own collection. Um, in my life, he's known for the uh, touring the universe through binoculars. Uh, he's wrote many articles about observing. And what intrigued me about uh, this article was um, a, a couple points along the way. He mentions the years in which the, the astronomical age of objects, and it helped open up my eyes to how old, but more importantly for me, how young and new the world or the world, the universe is around us. So I'm going to start off by explaining how we got the images that uh, we'll be looking at. So uh, SLU is one of the prescription um, or subscription uh, programs that you can join to be able to use remote telescopes. I do not believe it is as, as advanced for as I telescope in some of the settings, but it is less expensive and more readily accessible. And if we as a club wanted to, to set up a group to use SLU to start learning about the universe around us, we could, and the price would be reasonable. Schools are using this program, even in upper elementary ages, to be able to introduce kids to astronomy and at a level that wasn't possible back when I was in elementary school, late 70s and the early 80s. And in listening to the different teachers that have given talks about using SLU, I'm impressed with what the students are able to absorb because of the hands-on interaction. They're not doing astrophysics yet, but they're starting to get a grasp of, of the different types of, of nebulas and the shapes of the galaxies and the types of clusters. So they have two telescopes that are set up. There's uh, the Canary Islands, Mount uh, Talib in Spain, which is actually Canary Islands is part of Spain's uh, territory. A wonderful place to be able to look at the sky through their telescopes, draw back, the sands of the Sahara, when there's a sandstorm that starts whipping up, the telescopes shut down. And then also when you have a volcano in the Canary Islands, uh, like we had not all that long ago, if there's a change in wind direction to protect the optical equipment, they need to shut down and cover up. Uh, and just recently, Purdue University uh, is reported to, uh, had adopted a SLU for the undergraduate astronomy program. So, uh, up on top of a volcano, um, 12,198 feet. They also have, well, um, I'm going to go through the Canary Islands uh, Observatory first, and then I'll go and talk about the Chile uh, observatories. They have a 20 inch F6.8 Cassegrain style. It's got a bunch of fancy names. So I will just call it a Cassegrain style for now, but that is their one half meter. And in those dark skies, it does an incredible job. Uh, Canary two is a, what they call a wild wide field. It's a 17 inch F 6.8. And then piggybacked on top of it is a doublet refractor. Uh, that's 3.35 inches in diameter F seven. So sometimes when you select um, Canary 2 wide field, you, they will toss in the ultra wide field that's piggybacking as well. Canary 3 is the one that I'm partial to. It's the astrograph, um, very nice wide field of view. Uh, it's 11 inches in diameter, F2.2. 
So it, it is a wonderful imaging device. And I actually like it better than the half meter for many of the objects I go for. Now, if I'm going for something really tiny, then the half meter uh, shows its uh, glory. And they also have uh, Canary 4, which they call planetary and lunar uh, telescope as far as its setup. It's uh, 14 inches F11. And they do have Canary 5, which is a solar telescope, hydrogen alpha, 2.36 inches or 60 millimeter F8.3. And if it is clear and sunny and it's not too windy, they will uh, go ahead and do a feed over to YouTube that if you don't have a SLU subscription, you can still see what is going on. With that telescope, you get about two thirds of the disk of the sun and you'll see their operator from time to time switch the, the view around the full disk. So a good selection of telescopes. Now they also have telescopes in Chile, La De Hisa, uh, Chile. And I know my uh, Spanish teacher would be greatly disappointed in that pronunciation, but uh, we will run with it. So it is out in the desert, as you can see uh, by the image and it has opened up for me a whole new world of being able to observe the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, very exciting, especially like the large Magellanic Cloud. Um, beautiful stuff. It doesn't have as wide of a selection and sometimes it suffers from communication issues. Uh, occasionally Canary Island will as well, but they have their uh, Chile One, which is a wide field. 14-inch uh, F11, and actually it's about my second favorite scope of their whole collection. Uh, then they also have an ultra-wide field with a 90-millimeter uh, refractor uh, piggybacked on the 14-inch, uh, which is a Cassegrain for the 14-inch. They have a 17-inch uh, F6.8, depending upon the object, really wonderful objects or uh, detail you can get out of the objects. And then they do have a third Chile scope. They call it the lunar and planetary, but they reserve it for special events only, 14-inch uh, F11. And we will soon be going into the life and death of stars, but I'm bringing some of this stuff up now because the questions always come up. And I'm not sure it, how many people are members of SLU. As far as uh, anybody here a member of SLU? They started in 2003. Their popularity really started right around 2009. I heard about them 2013 and finally laid my money down in 2017. Don't want to rush into things. Mm -hmm. So the types of things, they originally had called the apprentice level, uh, the student level, but they've now broke the student level out to a different function. So for $100 a year, I am able to piggyback on other people's missions up to five at a time. And I get to go ahead and select one mission where I can either tell it the coordinates, the, the constellation, or go through the catalogs, NGC, Messier, the whole variety. Um, or I could do uh, what they call their SLU uh, 1000, which is the 1000 brightest objects. If you have a little more money, um, you can go to spend $300, but the advantage is you have unlimited regular missions and advanced missions. And as I watch a number of the people that are have been there longer, they will go ahead and take five, 10 images every five minutes to be able to stack them. And if you're interested in that level of image processing, the $300 is very a very low price. I just, as a pastor, haven't been up to that point where I could beg $300 from somebody else. Uh, family um, membership, this is something new, $99 a year uh, person and for their family members, uh, something that's relatively new to me. And then they have student membership packs uh, that are about $50. You don't necessarily have as much um, ability to do the advanced missions, but uh, this is where classrooms are put together. 
And there are school districts across the United States that are paying $50 for the semester fee for their students, whether it be upper elementary, junior high, or high school. So how to take an image. So the steps, without going through a whole bunch of screens, you select your telescope, you select your object. And as I mentioned, either it's a top 1000 for SLU and they keep adjusting that based upon season and they'll incorporate events like uh, the recent supernova or additional uh, comets, a variety of catalogs uh, by constellation and coordinate. And then you select the type of image processing. As I am at the novice level, and hopefully by the end of this month or middle of July, I'll go from Copernicus up to the Galileo, or Galileo level, um, longing for that Hubble level, but that's probably going to be a couple years out. Uh, it's based upon the number of images that you take. Uh, I have over 6,500 images on record with them. But they have... There's breakdowns on all of these. These are more general categories. And for those that people that uh, are comfortable using a CCD, these are the layman terms that we have in front of you. Generic, which is kind of just averaging everything together, uh, adjusted for a bright galaxy or comet or a bright star, um, all adjusting the exposure level and then different uh, stretching and, and filters applied. Faint galaxy or comet, faint nebula, globular cluster, large bright nebula, and open cluster. So if you are nervous about all the different terms for doing CCD, you can stay in the layman's level and utilize these categories, and they're mostly good. Uh, not perfect. Um, it makes me want to go ahead and actually use a CCD for certain images to be able to fine tune things. Uh, you get the files either as a JPEG, or if you want, you can go into a, a specific section and download the FITS files yeah. to be able to break out all the uh, parts that you need to manipulate the image. And I'll just give you a couple uh, examples. Uh, here, this is the Canary 2 Ultra Wide Field. So this is the piggyback scope. And we have the Supernova 2023 IXF. And it ends up being right there. And this image, oh, did I put enough of the date on it? They use the mouse to point it so we can see them. Oh, thank you. That'll be helpful. So right there, for those that are watching online, and we'll go to the next one. So this is the Canary 2. And you can see that uh, there's some looming effects where the brighter stars in the, the field will start introducing artifacts. But we start getting a, some nice detail on the swirling. These are unprocessed images uh, trying to do this presentation as much as close to what we would see through the telescope. So we won't have pretty colors and things. Occasionally, you can set it up for that. But anyways, we got the supernova right there. And this is the uh, Cassegrain scope view. This goes back to uh, April 1st, 2020, um, using the wide field. And if you look, that one. Yeah. You can see that we don't have that extra brightness right there. Now, depending upon the clarity of the sky, it, you will end up getting some awesome pictures on one night, just like you would out at the observatory, and other nights it's just blah. And then this is from Canary 3, the astrograph. Uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, M31, you can see the uh, satellite uh, galaxies to it uh, to just give an idea of what it can do. Now let's get started with our journey. What I love about Phil uh, Harrington's article is that you get to walk through the birth 
all the way to the, the final stages to the death of stars in one constellation. I mean, it can be done across constellations, but uh, this is the, the perfect season for looking at, at Scorpius as we go into summer. And it is a wonderful exploration. And if you want, let's see for those online, try not to get the glare, the life and death of stars in Scorpius. You can Google that, and this article will come up to be able to read online, which is a, a nice treat. So we're going to start with NGC 6357. Uh, this is through the uh, Chile 2 wide field. And you'll notice that we have a cloud of some type right here. So it's a large irregular patch of ionized hydrogen. Protostars are forming in this area that's here. Uh, when you view through a telescope, uh, you need an oxygen three filter to get the optimum view. Um, if with our skies, light pollution or the smoke from uh, Canada, um, you're not able to see NGC 6357, you can go look at the Lagoon Nebula M8 over in Sagittarius. So this structure with these protostars that are forming inside, and a number of the protostars are being blocked visually from us seeing them because of the thickness of the cloud, estimated to be about a million years old as those stars are beginning. That take us back here on Earth to the Cenozoic area, era, which would be glaciation, mastodons, mammoths, saber-toothed cats, um, incredible large mammals roaming the Earth. And I find it intriguing when we look out the stars, we talk about light years and the distance and the time. A million years is awful young, astronomically speaking. And also, I will address a white elephant in the room for some people. Uh, I am a pastor, and in some faith traditions, there is a timeline that is based upon uh, generations through the Bible going back to God's creation. I have respect for the work that went into it, but my first background is in chemistry, and with what we have learned and seen through chemistry and physics, especially uh, radio chemistry, there we have been given additional information which affects my view of timelines. And in my faith, my relationship to the creator isn't based upon what I perceive in one document. It's what I perceive in, throughout the universe. So some people... Uh, all of a sudden get nervous when I start uh, talking about timelines. And it is possible to be an astronomer or amateur astronomer and also a member of clergy. Uh, but uh, the view of the universe is much wider in my mind than in some. So let's go to the next object. Okay, you saw that we changed objects there. Let's go back to the other one aside from my bad registration, you'll see we still have the same image. And we have a object, and I hope I pronounce this right, I think it comes out of the Indian dialect, uh, Pismus um, 24. Uh, the, it is a large open cluster that is connected to NGC 6357. And approximately 6,900 light years away. And those stars will just be a little bit more than um, a million years old. They have matured enough that as they have condensed, they've started their uh, fusion and they have radiated out the uh, dust that was surrounding them, they're clearer to see. 
but uh, time of the mastodons and the mammoths. You gotta have both in, especially for this school. So we go to M6, the uh, object that is always worth looking at through the binoculars and especially through the telescope. So it has about three dozen stars when you look at it through binoculars. Um, when you start counting up all the stars there, it's about uh, 80 to 120, depending upon your telescope you're looking at or looking through it. First discovered by Charles Messier on May 23rd, 1764. Not too far away when we put things in the scale of the American history and we look at uh, the American Revolution in 1776. This gives us a bit of sense of the time and the society and the, the history that's there at when things were discovered. So these are our B type stars. And uh, they have a number of elements that are heavier than hydrogen. And many of the stars are thought to be two to 16 times the mass of the sun. And in stellar evolution, the more massive a star is, the quicker it goes through its life cycle. So these stars are rated at 80 to 100 million light years, which would put it back into the time of the dinosaurs, the Jurassic and uh, Cretaceous period. So to be able to have some connection, especially when you're at the scope and working with the public and you got a young kid that always seems to like dinosaurs, we, the, it'll get a little confusing for them as far as distance and light years, 1,590 light years, but the age of those stars being about the same as when dinosaurs were upon the earth, which in this ancient universe is very young. And one of the things that uh, is coming up as a continuing subject is alien life. And maybe I should make my hair a little wilder when I talk about that to go with an internet meme. My inclination as a kid that grew up always curious about UFOs, I had a UFO club in school and I kind of threw in the towel when somebody submitted uh, a sleigh in Santa Claus as a UFO on uh, December 24th. It was very clever for a second grader. <laughs> but um, it has always intrigued me. But as I read and as I study and look at the time and age of the universe, we might be on the early side for there to be lots of civilizations out there. And then also with each galaxy in its own evolution, uh, some are, are able to be a little further ahead than others. Um, between the stellar distance, between stars, as well as the availability of the heavier elements to be able to make life and then for life to be able to take those elements and make a society. I think that in my opinion, that we are on the earlier side. Maybe we are even a trendsetter. And then juggle that with your theology. So we go over to BM Scorpii, and this is a rant. Um, one of the drawbacks of uh, SLU is as you get a large catalog of images, 6,500 plus, they do not index things to your descriptions when you go with a right ascension declination and you're not going out of their catalogs. Um, you end up on the thumbnail getting gibberish. And uh, I spent uh, the last two days going back through because I did take images of BM Scorpio. I wasn't on the SLU 1000 list, but um, I did have it and I do have it, but I can't index it and they do not have it set up to search. If you join SLU, there is something called tags and you'll want to categorize or tag your images to make it easier for you to 
look back through them. Uh, as I conclude the rant and asking Slew to join the 21st century and its search options, uh, it was a wonderful time to go back and reflect on solar eclipses, a number of comets and a number of supernovas, and some incredibly clear nights uh, looking at NGCs and M objects, but not finding BM Scorpii. So it's a K-type star, kind of orangish to reddish. It's about a mass of 91.86 times the sun. In our telescopes, it's about magnitude six. And it falls in to the time range uh, still within the realm of dinosaurs going back to uh, as life began to evolve out of the sea going on to land. And a really beautiful orange star, if you could find the image that you had saved. <laughs> and don't worry, I'll have other rants later on. <laughs> So we go to M7, once again, a wonderful binocular object. And it's about 200 million light years ago, still in the age of the reptiles, uh, probably going back more to uh, the Cretaceous period. Um, at the point that the stars in M7 were have forming, Pangaea, the supercontinent, was starting to break up on Earth. And uh, once again, I find that uh, these stars, as I look at them, are surprisingly young in the geological context. We go over to NGC 62331. And with this, uh, they're type O and type B uh, stars within here. Its nickname is the Northern Jewel Box. And they're about two to seven million years old. And a uh, little bit younger than the stars in M7. I think I I have a note in my mind that I didn't write down on my paper and we're coming up to it. So, um, very beautiful object. And we go to the Henry Draper, 147513. And uh, through the slew scopes, it looks like a star, not as big or bright as Antares. That's about a fifth magnitude, a G type. Um, they've determined that it has at least one exoplanet. And the uh, exoplanet might be about 1.2 masses of Jupiter. The star is just a little bit older than us, uh, by maybe 10% older. And it's about 11% uh, at more massive. So if we want to be able to look at something close to an Earth twin, uh, HD 147513. Now um, we should be able to find that uh, out at the observatory and that's gonna be on my wish list after uh, the public has observed. And there is also another uh, near-Earth twin, a little more popular. Oops. 18 Scorpii, and uh, it's about 2.9 billion years old with the range for the Earth 3.5 to, to 4.5 billion years old, and is probably a more exact solar twin to the sun. And with that being at 2.9 billion, billion with a B, years ago, that would be about the time we estimate the beginning of photosynthesis in the seas. 
which I find intriguing. One of my other occupations, vocations, is um, monitoring uh, fresh water sources like rivers and lakes. And I deal with a lot of photosynthesis in the form of nice slimy algae. So M4, another wonderful binocular object. And then we get, this was the object that, uh, I forgot where I had it. We get a bonus image here. This is using the Canary 3 uh, astrograph. We pick up NGC 6144, not too far away. Always like it when we're, you're able to pick up something else. One of the interesting things that uh, SLU is commonly used for is when you have, um, let's say, Mars going through the beehive, the M44, or you have uh, very close, close conjunctions, um, you're able to capture those images. So the stars in M4 are about 12.2 billion years old. So now we're all of a sudden going from within the scale of the Earth to something beyond the scale of the Earth and Sun and solar system, 12.2 billion years old. Um, the interesting thing, it's called M4 after Charles Mizier, he discovered it in 1764, both many other scientific discoveries it uh, is also credited to Philippe Les de Chazal. And it's French, and I, I'm, if I'm bad with Spanish, I'm worse with French. Uh, but he had discovered it in 1745. What is interesting is in the science of astronomy, M4 was the first globular cluster to be resolved to stars. And you can see that as we're able to actually see many of the stars on the outer edge. We go to M80, and it's at 12.54 uh, billion years old. It's even larger yet, but it's also much farther away. Uh, has about 200,000 stars in it, uh, but also it is farther away from us. If we M4 is 6,033 light years away, M80 is 28,000 light years away. And those are all usually with a plus or minus 200, 500, or even 1,000 uh, is. Uh, the mathematics and the observations continue to, to resolve. So many of these stars, this is so old, it has what's called blue stragglers. These are younger stars that have formed out of the remains of the original stars. So some of the stars that have already gone nova or supernova within that globular cluster. Now we go to Antares, and this is where, even with the bright star setting, uh, a, a very bright star uh, overwhelms the processor, but we can kind of see that orangishness there. Um, it's viewed as hard of the Scorpion, partly because of its color and also its location. Um, Many times its color can be comparable to Mars. It is a lot closer uh, to us than the globular clusters, being that it's within our galaxy, 550 light years away. It is a red supergiant, which we they're still fine tuning the calculations, but if you plunked it in the center of the solar system in place of the sun, it would reach out somewhere between Mars and Jupiter. So us rocky planets in the inner solar system would not be the inner solar system. We would be ash uh, in relationship to the situation. It's estimated to be about um, 
let's see, 11 to 12 million years old. It's about 12 times the mass of the sun. And it has a double star. Anybody see the double star in this image? And uh, you're probably not having any luck. And hopefully, if Phil's not watching online, he'll watch the uh, recording. Um, the It's a blue-white for the smaller companion, Antares B. Um, but because of the glare of Antares itself, it's sometimes viewed as a green star, going back to uh, many months ago in a meeting in a discussion about green stars and do they exist. Okay. So the uh, influence of the orange to red um, overpowering um, Antares B. And I have not tried with the 12 or the 16 to resolve uh, in my eight inch uh, classic Celestron. I haven't been able to resolve it with the uh, skies that I have around my home between Fort Wayne and Bluffton. But uh, that is another star that's on my wish list. And once again, the larger the star, the faster it goes through its life cycle, we now go to when things have ended. So as I look through my different images, this is probably the most colorful and brightest uh, that I have uh, for NGC 6302. Uh, this was taken with the uh, Chile 1 wide field scope. And it is a planetary nebula, uh, but it in itself is a unique trait where it's called a bipolar nebula. And without being able to have a graphic, if depending upon the angle in which we see the expanding planetary nebula in relationship to its magnetic poles will affect how we see it. Uh, it's called the bug nebula because it kind of looks like it's got some antennas coming off of it at one pole. And uh, it is thought that it erupted 1,900 years ago. So that, that puts us in the range of just after Jesus. Um, as far as the earliest recorded study of it, um, partly because of its faintness, was 1907 by Edward uh, Emerson uh, Bernard. And uh, to think that from 1907 to now, we can be able to observe it fairly easily using our 16 inch when it was not even really known or studied before 1907. Once again, on the scales of calendars, I find that amazing. The next object is being copyrighted by General Mills. <laughs> it's the Cheerio Nebula, Nebula, NGC 6337. And some of these names drive me crazy. When I started to learn amateur astronomy in um, 1988 and 89, we didn't have all these fancy names. And I keep encountering somebody say, whoa, do you know about such and so, or did you see this image of that? I'm like, what is that? They don't, sometimes when they talk, they don't include the NGC number. Not that I have a memorized, but it helps me more so than the name. So if you look real close, you'll see this little circle there. And this is also a bipolar uh, planetary nebula, but we're looking at it probably about uh, 90 degrees different on the angle. And for both of these, they were stars that as they had used up their hydrogen fuel and went through the whole sequence to going to iron, that uh, they could not maintain the outward pressure. So gravity caused a collapse. That collapse compressed stuff too much, which then allowed for the energy release and the blowing off of uh, the gas shell and then forming a neutron star. Um, 
for this one, uh, the Cheerio or the ghostly Cheerio, some people call it. Uh, it's got a rapidly rotating uh, neutron star in the center, not visible to us as amateurs with most of our equipment. So we've gone from the beginning of stars to stars being old enough that go beyond the history of the solar system. What happens to the next stage for some of the stars? We look at Scorpius X1. I think you heard my rant earlier. Uh, and I actually imaged it with another object, which I'll talk about here in a second. But discovered in 1962, not with visual light, but as the first extrasolar outside our solar system X-ray source. It, other than the sun, this ends up being the next brightest in X-rays. It's about 9,000 light years away. It is a low mass X-ray binary. Uh, the neutron star is about 1.4 solar masses. And the donor star that continues to have its material drawn into the neutron star is only 0.42 masses. And in that type of situation with the neutron star, when it's able to take material from uh, another star, that ends up giving it extra energy. And in the process between gravitational collapse and expansion, it generates X-rays. Now, the star next to it, uh, we are able to see a little bit hard, but we can see it, but we can't see it. And it is thought that it was observed uh, as a supernova in around 393 AD, uh, observed and recorded by the Chinese, and it became first magnitude and held at first magnitude for eight months. So with the new talk on Betelgeuse possibly going nova within the next 10 years or increment of 10 years versus 1,000 or 100,000 years, we might be able to experience the same thing within our lifetime. But alas, don't fall prey to some of the people that are reporting that it's going to be blowing up tomorrow. But we will watch it and, and hope for a surprise. I, I hope that uh, the Lord isn't too upset with us wanting celestial fireworks. It's all part of his creation. So the uh, binary that we can uh, view is V818 Scorpii. It fluctuates in its brightness from 12 to 13th magnitude. Um, and it is what is left of uh, the functioning pairs. It still itself is emitting light versus X-rays like Scorpius X1. So comments, questions? It's yeah, I got a question about the, the slew. Man. First, thanks very much for your talk. Yeah, excellent. Really, really great. <laughs> But on the slew, it was saying you get like five missions of one super mission or something. So you can only take six pictures or? Well, that's that with the novice level. Oh, I see. So once you pay the $300, you can go crazy. Oh, well, how do you get all these 6,000 pictures if you're just a novice? So what I do is many of them, I'm interested in Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and Venus. Huh? Um, yes, I do have Neptune, Uranus, and Pluto, but I have to get my star chart out and, and or take pictures over a series of nights to be able to get that movement. But uh, many of the items that I want to observe, somebody else is also observing them. So what you would do is you go through the night's roster of observation times, huh? and uh, you click a little button to join that mission. Oh, 
And after a while, you learn to make sure you look for Galileo or uh, Herschel or, or Hubble level uh, astronomers because they are they paid the extra money and they can do a few more adjustments to be able to tweak and pull the, the fullness of the image out as a raw image before processing. Okay. So you can cheat. These that I have showed you this evening, I've deliberately made effort to be the one that set up that mission. And that's why I did not pull from somebody else's missions for those that were missing out of my uh, catalog. They are there, they're just not indexed right. And I gotta go picture by picture. Okay. But uh, anyways, so at the $300 level, you're able to go ahead as the schedule is open, do five or, or 10 in a row to be able to stack. And I've seen uh, some of uh, the pro amateur level astronomers um, go ahead and do that over a series of nights. And a few have done it over a series of years and have come up with incredible images once they're able to stack them all together. But uh, I am a beggar, so I see who is interested in the same thing as me. It takes a little extra effort. Yeah. Um, and sometimes being the uh, kind of the run to the litter uh, when it comes time to feeding, I have to plan what I want to do two or three days in advance to make sure I get the time slot to get the object above the horizon enough not to have uh, the atmospherics affect it as much. And I know that I had said I don't believe that we have yet the time and been able to overcome the distance for aliens. I do believe that NASA, the CIA, the United States government, and SLU conspire against me. <laughs> there are times when you get a run for like a, a supernova or a comet, and, and you're able to go night after night, and all of a sudden, mission failed. Mission did not run. Mission failed. And you go into the log for that night, and you find out, Clouds, wind, humidity, sand for, uh, from yeah. the Sahara, those all work against you. And we have more clear nights when you average together Chile and uh, Canary Islands, but it's not as perfect as you think. And when I really get excited, usually I bring our Indiana rain with me over to Canary Islands or Chile. Uh -huh. And what uh, I like is uh, when we are in our winter and things are pretty glum, the observing down in Chile is much better. But every now and then I want to be able to get an extra mission in. You got Canary Islands next to Spain, you got Chile, which is kind of due south of us. So there's an hour difference and I can quickly hop in and do an observation in Canary Islands and then compare it to Chile. Mm -hmm. And in the summer, it's cloudy. Cloudy. Who has clouds in the desert? That isn't what I was told. But uh, yeah. it's opened my eyes up to uh, the weather in, in other areas. But uh, to be able to do this as a layperson and armchair astronomy and to be able to start to touch into things and record images and compare images, it is a great opportunity. Uh, I telescope. Uh, I've studied a little bit from afar. They charge by the hour, but you have more control of the parameters. And uh, trying to remember if it's Nevada or Arizona where they have some scopes, and I think they've uh, added scopes in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the internet time delay uh, gets a little frustrating, especially if communications are down. Chile seems to go down more frequently than Canary Islands, but they are remote places. And uh, if things are set up and the Knight's mission list was downloaded to their computers at their observatories, they'll still run the uh, missions without uh, you necessarily being able to monitor them. It, you can go into what's called a live view mode to be able to see what is uh, e what each scope is looking at. And then you can, you have a little 
picture or camera icon you click if you want to save that image. So that's another way you can kind of get more out of your one advanced and five regular missions. And that requires a little more time looking at the schedule and then planning when you're going to be looking at each scope to be able to add in those additional images. Yes. Do you control the camp? All right, you get your object. And now when you want to take pictures, do you set up the parameters like how many, how many times and what's the length and all the other stuff that goes for the camera? So what they do is they have kind of a uh, recipe book based upon the class of object and the object. The SLU 100 or SLU 1000 objects, they have already had their professional astronomers adjust those parameters. So if you go with a, a SLU 1000, you'll probably get a very good image. But uh, if you go into what I call the laypersons, you got this as your basis to choose from. So when you have something that is extremely faint or something that's extremely bright, these settings here just don't quite do it. Um, sometimes you might need to go to a faint galaxy um, when you're dealing with a bunch of faint stars you're trying to image. Uh, is it possible to be able to work out uh, magnitudes, um, to be able to measure variable stars? Yes, it is. I'm learning about it. Uh, AAVSO has uh, some very long, three hour long um, discussions and they connect you to the software to be able to do it and the image processing to get to that point and then using their algorithm for calculating magnitude. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes you have to mix and match. And with my only having one advanced mission in any one time, as soon as that advanced mission is done, I can uh, go ahead and schedule another one, but that scope I may want may be full for the rest of the evening. So it, it's, I wanna set up a grid and be able to test out each of these settings on uh, some key objects to, to find where the optimum is. So when you, when you bring up a paint nebulous setting, does that set the parameters or do you have to longer to exposure? It, it does a longer exposure. Um, I am not uh, versed in all the different parts of the CCD imaging, uh, but there's uh, adjustments. I'm used to regular old photography. You have the equivalent of adjustment of contrast mm -hmm. as well as uh, the exposure. And then um, stretching in one axis over another and uh, interpolating uh, data to come up with the data bits between your data bits. Um, so maybe at some point when I feel a little more flushed with money, I'll try the, uh, the advanced because some of those astronomers that are not on staff with SLU, but have been around for a while and have the advance, they're they're doing far more than just what I'm able to see when it comes to image setting. So can you get the FITS files or yes, back up? You can. So when they when they do your your thing, do they just take one picture or do you get the what's really set? So what wanna, they do FITS is the native yeah, yeah. Uh, file format, yeah. but because there's a lot of armchair astronomers, your preview images and your simple images to download will be JPEGs. Uh, for okay. the size uh, of working with the PowerPoint, these are all JPEGs. Yeah, sure. But uh, you have to go into a different section. It's a little more work uh, to be able to get it. But once you have that whole FITS file, then you can start manipulating all the other parameters. So is that a, a sum of a stack or do they give you individual? Individual, I believe. I, oh, it's so something you that- take 30 frames or something mm -hmm. and stack them yourself yeah. or whatever. It's, so, just more, it's just quite a bit of work. That's yeah. Great, I guess. And usually what they do for a mission is they block them off into five minutes 
uh, sections and some of the missions will run quick uh, and others much longer. And as you watch the live missions, you'll see the image developing and uh, the brighter galaxies or nebulas come right away and the faint ones, if it's watching paint dry, technically not because as a chemist, I have had to measure how much, how long it takes paint to dry. <laughs> and it's way quicker than that. Um, but uh, it's interesting to see the difference and you get an inkling of uh, the different settings. Okay. So. For its price, it's got a lot of features. It's fairly reliable, except for my complaint about the NASA, CIA, and the aliens conspiring against me, mm -hmm. which is actually just the weather. Um, and my expectation of the tropics being blue and clear skies all the time, which it isn't. Oh, hurricanes too, and typhoons can be a problem, mm -hmm. uh, which will shut things down. So other questions? Uh, how long do they store these images? I'm going to be finding out. Uh, my very first images go back to July of 2017. And it's interesting to see where my fascination on objects has developed as I went back through my, my files. So I'm working on five going into six years. And they do not list a data cap. It's a bear to go through and find some stuff if it's not tagged right. And I've you learned my can download these in, your images anytime, only your right? Yeah, your account. Only, only yours. Mm -hmm. okay. But once you download them, you can share them with whoever you want. Yeah. I mean, in the image we have here, you, you see where it originally came from. But you can use this image if you were to publish something in Sky and Telescope you just give credit to which scope you used at SLU or if you were doing something for a college paper or research. Mm -hmm. So this is my image. And technically they allow you when you join in on somebody else's uh, mission, once it's downloaded to your file, that is you use it. So, um, they are yours, so to speak. Other Neil, questions? Neil, how far north can the uh, can the scope see? Can it see Polaris? Does it? Um, I have a few images of Polaris. Um, okay. okay. So from the Canary Islands, obviously not from Chile. Right. But uh, the timing with uh, once you start going down that low, uh, your window of opportunity is very narrow. Okay. Because not only is it a matter of the uh, altitude from the horizon, but also you're dealing with the peaks of the uh, volcano. <laughs> we don't have that problem in Fort Wayne, thank goodness. No, there are times when <laughs> in uh, observing, you can observe it early in the evening. And then all of a sudden, there's like two or three hours. It'll tell you it's not visible. And then all of a sudden, it's visible again. And it's because of uh, being eclipsed. Do they have but, tools to help you out with that for planning sessions? Uh, they guide you along the way. Um, as you schedule the mission, they'll tell you a go or no go as far as is it visible. They'll also give you a caution if it is very low on the horizon and you may get poor image quality yeah. uh, because of the atmospherics. They'll still okay. let you do it. But then they also have to deal with their parameter on how far to the horizon their scope and mounts can go. Sure. And I found that it's not equal amongst the telescopes. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for your time. And for its richness, by ability. You seeing them? You should be seeing them. Fifty-one. Yeah, it is. All right. This show and tell segment was supposed to be for people that uh, do imaging to uh, display some of the stuff that they've done over the past month and to uh, encourage people to look at the uh, at the uh, viewing challenge and try to try to actually take some uh, images of those things, because I try to put uh, some simple stuff and some obscure objects in there. 
uh, and I think I'm going to be emphasizing the uh, more of the binaries uh, in there. I know Mizar, when I imaged Mizar, that was really pretty fascinating, just seeing all of the stars and realizing they were all doubles themselves. So instead of three stars, you actually have six. But this is, uh, <clears throat> I'm really not, I'm not a skilled imager, um, but this, uh, this is my M50, uh, M51. Um, and uh, the image platform I have is uh, an astrophysics uh, uh, Starfire, uh, 130 millimeter, five inch uh, scope. Uh, it's on an AP uh, 400 mount. The, uh, the camera is a uh, ASI 178 monochrome. And uh, this particular image is a uh, stacked uh, 20 images, uh, 20 30 second images, so 600 seconds of data. Uh, the camera control software is SharpCap, and it does the uh, it does the stacking. It'll also do uh, dark frame sub subtraction as well as uh, flat fielding on the uh, uh, flat framing on each of the individual images. But this was uh, this this was done stacking raw, and then uh, uh, dark frame subtraction and flat fielding done later. the uh, The flat fielding actually works out, or, or flat frame rather, actually works out really well takes out a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, the poorly exposed areas. I see in the lower uh, right corner, I still have a, a bit of stuff that shouldn't be there from the, from the flat frame, but I could, have, uh, I could have taken that out very simply with uh, cropping, but I did not. Um, so anyway, uh, maybe over, over time, my imaging will get better, but uh, you know, for 30 second subs, I think that, that turns out pretty nicely. At least I like it. And the stars are round, basically, uh, perhaps a bit bloated, but certainly round. So uh, the tracking for 30 second subs seems to be uh, okay. Any other questions or comments? So do you drag that out of your garage or do you get it mounted somewhere? Or what do you do there with your school? Uh, basically the, uh, the entire setup is, uh, is exactly set up. The entire rig is stored, uh, uh, torn down and I take the tripod and the equatorial head and uh, assemble it all and you know mount the scope and uh, and the rest of it uh, uh, every time I want to use it. I don't have any fixed facility uh, but it is in my backyard so there is a degree of, of light pollution that uh, I seem to have managed to got, have gotten around uh, okay. so far. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool, man. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, here we go. Prominences. Uh, Neil yeah. had mentioned that uh, the solar scope, uh, either in the Canaries, I think in the no, in the in the Chilean telescope, only does about three quarters of the sun. Well, if I do, uh, if I use my uh, uh, my Lunt eighty millimeter, uh, I ended up with about a little more than three quarters of the sun, uh, unless I put a uh, um, a field reducer on it in order to get the entire image to, to uh, uh, in order to get the entire uh, image uh, into the scope or into the camera. But what we have here is just an example of some uh, some arch prominences, uh, a nice hedgerow down in the uh, the lower uh, right. Can I say corner quadrant four, uh, and then another arch uh, up here. It turns out that the uh, exposures, in order to get the uh, the prominences, uh, at least the way I'm doing it, turns out to be substantially longer than the disk. These are all of 14 milliseconds uh, gain of one, um, so that that really helps. These were these were taken on the same AP 400 mount, so it's nice to be able to kind of sit uh, and let it soak for all of those uh, all of those 14 uh, milliseconds. Let's see here. Let's blow that up just a little bit. And you can you can start to see some of the uh, the interesting vein structure uh, in in the, uh, in the uh, prominences and some of the other um, features along the disc itself. Uh, we've jumped over to the uh, to the next image, and this one just shows the top uh, three quarters of the sun, and you have another nice prominence up here, and then the the same two uh, over on the side. Is there anything to be gained looking at the top? Let's see. Yeah, it's just a nice arch. Interesting, uh, just interesting structure um, in, in all of these prominences. I, I kind of enjoy doing those. And let's see. 
This is a, a solar disc. This is using uh, the same camera and Lunt, uh, only it's uh, got the 2x focal reducer on it. Uh, and I believe I did uh, a, a two by two binning on this. And I think it came out fairly nicely, a minimal amount of, uh, of uh, photo work on it. So we can take a closer look at this. You see some nice detail of the uh, granulation on the sun. Uh, this, this is a very nice filament. This one doesn't have any filaments going to the edge, um, but we do have a, a number of bright uh, plage areas here. Uh, uh, here and some structure between the uh, the two sets of uh, of uh, sunspots here. Uh, another another filament area. Another very nice sunspot here, uh, and then a train of uh, of about three or four here. Some little ones right here. So those are kind of fun. Let's see. Moving on to some of the spectroscopic work uh, from uh, from the month. Um, I was, uh, we're part of a, a pro-am project right now that's imaging, not imaging, but taking spectra of a, a star uh, named uh, TCRB, uh, it's Coma Bernice, uh, and the, uh, the star is thought to be a, well, it's, it's a known, uh, it's, it's a known, not supernova star, but uh, uh, a, a periodic eruptor, uh, and the last time it erupted was about 1946, and before that it was about uh, 80 years earlier, so in about 1886. Uh, and we're coming up on that 80th anniversary of the 1946 uh, eruption. Uh, and there was, was, was a request to, to the group I'm in to start imaging this, because the thought is that this star, uh, since it's starting to show some variable characteristics that it hasn't over the past 80 years, that it might be getting ready to pop again. Uh, and so the group that, that I'm in uh, is, uh, is starting to take spectra of this, and the requested frequency was about once a week. And uh, what we see here in this uh, are three uh, spectra, as it turns out. Uh, I have two uh, toward the blue end. That the blue end is uh, is about 3,800 over here on the left, and uh, uh, ends just uh, about 50, uh, 5,900 here uh, in the middle, and then uh, on up is is the red end. This, by the way, is uh, is uh, atmospheric water. <clears throat> The rest of this shows the uh, characteristics uh, of an M star like uh, Antares. And most of these sawtooth patterns are due to uh, a molecule called titanium, titanium oxide, I believe. Might be titanium dioxide. I'm not absolutely sure of the chemistry. Uh, but interesting in this, you'll see that uh, we get uh, very strong um, emission lines uh, on some of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the hydrogen lines. So hydrogen alpha, uh, hydrogen beta is, is very strong. And then interestingly enough, we have this, this O2 uh, or titanium, they're very close together around 4690. And given the resolution uh, that the spectroscope with the uh, grading it has uh, installed for this, it's not really possible to tell the two apart. But given that there's titanium in the other parts of it uh, and oxygen, uh, it could be either one or it could actually be both. But the interesting part is that the uh, that the O uh, the O three seems to, uh, the O two excuse me uh, seems to go away. You got a very very strong uh, emission here, and then no more than about twelve minutes later, it's kind of gone. Uh, and that is very unusual flicker. That's a very short time frame for a star, especially one uh, that's a supergiant. And as a matter of fact, the uh, the hydrogen beta line does the same thing. So these two do, these two emission lines are, are are apparently flickering. So that's something uh, that I want to continue to study and, and take spectra of to see how that works out. I can't really think of a of a good explanation for it except for um, except for flicker, the star flickering itself, atmospherics or optics. Uh, uh, tracking, uh, they, it just doesn't make sense because the rest of it actually looks pretty consistent. So this will be an area that I'll be keeping an eye on. Let's see, is that about it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And as I said, these are like 12 minute exposures and I try to do, I try to do a set of four so that I can uh, stack them digitally uh, and then uh, get a noise reduction based on the, uh, the stacking of them. And that was in the process in the process of doing that, uh, I found this difference uh, in, the, in the two sets of images. 
let's see. <clears throat> oh, and this uh, this slide just shows the uh, the images that went into the the stacks, and these bright spots right here turn out to be the emission lines. That's how you you can tell emission lines uh, on a star. And the emission lines, by the way, come from a shell uh, around the star that's usually uh, uh, it, usually energized by ultraviolet light. But being an M star, there's not a whole lot of uh, ultraviolet light, so I'm not quite sure where they come from. But it's usually it's usually a, a, a disk of gas. So we've got a we've got a an emission line here and here, and you can you can see one here, and that sort of matches up with this broad hump here. So here we have the uh, the hydrogen beta. Over here we have a, a dimmer uh, O2. Uh, here we have a, an O2, and here we have a H beta. They're both here. And in this spectra, we have the O2, but not the uh, not the H beta. And in this one down here, this was a this was only um, a 10 minute uh, exposure, and you can see that we get the uh, the O2, but not the H beta as well. So it's interesting that we get this flicker. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, and this is just the same thing, but uh, with a normalized uh, spectra. Uh, using a spectra that is normalized like this, you can measure line intensities uh, a lot easier. And I think, I think there was just one other I wanted to share. Uh, and I think it's this one. This is uh, the reflected sunlight uh, that uh, took out a very cloudy night. Uh, and you can see the progression of, of image, uh, the effect of image uh, calibration uh, as you go up. This bottom one is the raw image uh, that we took of the moon. This is about a one, one, uh, one second exposure with a gain of four. And you do get, you know, nice lines, you do see uh, a, a lot of the spectral features. Um, but when you do the, uh, uh, the, the dark frame subtract uh, in the middle one, and then when you do the, uh, the, flat, uh, the flat frame division, it, uh, you actually get the, uh, a lot of the flat framing and uh, instrument response, uh, both of those applied in this. Uh, and the flat framing makes all of the lines more consistent, um, but the instrument response correction uh, makes up for the camera's sensitivity, both uh, the lower sensitivity back in the in the blue uh, and in the red. Uh, and so you get a truer picture of the way the spectra is supposed to look. And it really brings the uh, the highlights uh, out um, in the uh, in the calcium lines here and a very nice uh, uh, hydrogen line down here at 3835. And the camera's response down here is very, very weak. So very interesting there. <clears throat> So anyway, that was all uh, in the past month. So thought I would share those with you and uh, take any questions that you might have. Okay, Julie, back to you. All right, thank you. A lot of good stuff there. Thank you. Uh, I guess, is there anything else before we? Did everybody see that uh, announcement that Science Central is going to have uh, uh, an event for the uh, annular eclipse coming up on uh, October 15th? Right. And, uh, anyways, they are going to conduct the <laughs> launch, document the eclipse. They're going to have telescopes on the hand, be able to view the eclipse safely. And other programs, whatever, like that, you know, they're all going to tell uh, solar glass that they're, and it's also going to occur, uh, see, uh, at the same day that they're having their uh, uh, Comic Con style event. So, uh, <laughs> no. If you've got your Star Wars and Star Trek uniforms, I guess you can go down the road. So it's not like it's going to be a fun day. That's October 14th. A mixed reality and not so reality. <laughs> yeah, but I'm kind of curious. Uh, this is interesting. There's clouds. It says high altitude uh, weather balloon, and they're going to uh, take photos of the event. So I assume that the same thing they're going to do next April. Oh, so if you have it's too small to accuse it of trying to do it. So. <laughs> well, maybe they'll shoot it down. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, anything else? I guess that's it for the meeting. All right. Oh, thanks everybody for joining online and in person next year next year okay and uh i thought i saw i forget what's coming up in july uh next month we're inviting everybody
Well, that's a good jury card. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we're going to get some food and check out and yeah. make our scopes. And yeah, it could be a good time. Some of the members have a seat for us. That's a good time. You can be able to have a so do the hummus and you can go around and look at them and get 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 some hamburgers and hot dogs. Yeah, this is where again. Okay, all right. That's what I thought you were gonna do. Trick trick right. working around the edge for 30 years now. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Oh, all right. All right. Well, that's it. All right. <laughs> See you all later. All right, take care. See you guys. Over and out. I think I'm on the stairs. Yeah, just, uh...